Hi, I'm Andrew Locke. Thank you again for watching another episode of Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, we're gonna take a look at the Nanlux Evoque 900C, which boasts a 900 watt RGB LAC light engine. This light is weather protected, so you can use it outside in the rain. It has loads of control options, not just one, but two local area network connections, Bluetooth Wi-Fi connectivity, it has wired DMX capability, as well as my personal favorite, CRMX Lumen Radio Control. The light has a light engine capable of doing 1,800 Kelvin all the way up to 20,000 Kelvin. And this is the first light I've tested that actually does get all the way up to 20,000 Kelvin. And it has all of the rich saturated colors that you'd expect from a light engine with six color emitters. So what a lot of you probably want to know straight away is how powerful is this unit when it's teamed up with its reflectors? Could you use it through a window like you could a HMI, but with the ability to have full saturated colors? Now the light here is set up about four to five meters away from the front window of my house. And I didn't anticipate getting much light, so I'm using the spot dish. Now this is my front room, and at the moment it's just lit with the ambient daylight coming in through the window. And bang, I was very surprised with how much light I actually got. Now I just want to point out that all of this coloured light is coming from the 900C outside the window. There are no other lights in the room. The thing that surprised me was how well it could generate dark colours. Now that I had some more faith in what the light could bang out, I tried the 45 degree dish. Now this dish at a distance of about four to five meters away gives very Fresnel light qualities. In terms of output, this light very much feels to me to be a 1.2K HMI equivalent, but with full color. Next, I tried the Fresnel attachment. And again, it feels like a 1.2K HMI in terms of output, but it's got full color. All right, let's start going through the pros and cons, starting off with the cons first. And for me, a real big con with this system is it doesn't have a dedicated Fresnel for the 900. So these big Fresnels were designed for the 1200 and the 1200B. Now it might make sense having a Fresnel system this large for a 1200, because you're probably gonna be punching it through a window, but for me, I would like to use the 900s as an interior light in locations. And this setup is just way too big for doing that. Now, the next negative with this uh, Fresnel is it's not optically lined up for the 900, which has a different COB configuration. This results in some hue issues, which we'll talk about later in the episode. Now, hopefully we'll see a smaller Fresnel made for this unit soon. Now, the next negative is on the power supply. It does have a Nutrix power in, but it doesn't have a power through. And I know that upsets some of you guys who are riggers. Now the next negative you've probably already heard, and that is the cooling fans. The cooling fans are a little bit on the loud side. Now this is currently running in the smart mode, so it's not running at full power. Now I would be a little bit concerned about having this within two meter range of a boom mic if I was doing interviews, for example. Now the next negative is something that I've found with point source lights that don't have white LED emitters. In other words, lights like this, which mix all of their color emitters together to generate white light. So what I've found over the years of testing here is RGB WW lights tend to have a wider beam spread and tend to have a more even color distribution from edge to edge of the beam. And that is the case here. This light is very spotty compared to other lights and it also has some color hue issues towards the edge of the beam, which vary depending on the reflector dish that you have attached. Now, is this color hue problem going to be necessarily a problem for you on set? Well, from my experience, if you're working in the average location, such as a house, you're never going to see it. But if you're working on a white psych, it can be a bit noticeable. Now let's get into the pros. But before that, we're gonna talk about another problem that I found with RGB LAC lights, all lights that are using a combination of color emitters mixed together to generate white. So with RGBWW lights, I've noticed that if you're doing a transition from white light to a colored light, 
they can all do it fairly smoothly. And it's quite a simple process because they've got their white emitters and they've got their color emitters and they're just fading between the two. Whereas a light source like this, which has multiple color emitters mixing together to make white, can often have issues. Quite a few of them, the color will skew as it's doing its transition. Or halfway through the transition, when all the LED emitters start to mix together, the brightness levels can pop. And that absolutely wrecks the effect. But that is not the case with this light because it is one of the most highly calibrated light engines that I've come across. So here I've got some random color hues dialed in and I'm cross fading to them from 5600 Kelvin. The crossover duration is two and a half seconds. As you can see, it's not cross fading to any other color in between and there's no radical changes in exposure. Now in terms of other pros, number one is connectivity. You've got 2.4G Bluetooth, the NAN Link app, DMX with RDM, Lumen Radio CRMX, Artnet, SACN and wide DMX control. It also has fantastic color modes such as XY, an advanced HSI mode, a Lee Gels library, RGBW mode, as well as eight and 16 bit crossover modes in the DMX. It's got a CCT range from 1800 to 20,000 Kelvin with plus minus green capability and it tracks to the Planckian curve. Other improvements are the build quality. So the 1200B was quite a well-built unit, but with the C here, they've improved the build quality, namely on the bottom. The air vent here no longer bends, it has a fantastic user interface with a large big color screen and an IP55 weather rating. For its firepower and capabilities, it is actually quite lightweight and it can operate on any angle at all. Okay, so let's go through how much this kit costs and what you get for your money. Now, it isn't cheap, but it is good. All right, so you're looking at 4,660 US dollars and I've seen it listed for 7,829 Australian dollars. That seems to be about the average prices I've found. Now, um, I'm not sure if you can get this without the bag. So the price I've given you is for this kit here, which is the Evoke 900C ST kit. Now it comes in this bag. The bag has wheels at one end and just let you know, the bag is quite heavy. Let's get this around the right way so I can open it up. Now the light does fit in this bag with the stirrup attached, but it is a bit of a tight fit to get the cables in. All right, so let's start pulling things out of the kit. So the light does fit in the bag with the stirrup or the yoke attached. Now the yoke is removable. So let's just have a quick look at that. I'm gonna give you a quick tip. So um, one of the things I've had happen in rentals with my um, uh, 1200Bs is the metal on top or the metal underneath uh, can end up bent from people trying to get the light off the stirrup. So they're giving the light a bang. So here's what I'd suggest, rather than doing that, rather than hitting the light, what I'd suggest is undo the stirrups, have it sitting on a table like this, and then give the stirrup a bang and that will remove the, um, the stirrup quite easily without you denting or damaging the light, okay? But uh, with this 900C, uh, it looks like they've used a thicker gauge metal on the air vent, so it doesn't look like that's gonna be a problem. All right, so let's do a quick walk around on the light. So we've got two local area network connections. You've got your DC power in, which is 48 volts regulated. You've got a DMX out and a DMX in. Now underneath the light, you have your USB port for firmware updates and you have a port here for remote control, which is yet to be released. Now the build quality is quite good. It's got industrial plastic or polymer. Here is, uh, what's that called, carbon fiber. Now I thought that was decorative. I, I thought that was just, you know, plastic with a carbon fiber finish on it. Now I had to fix one of my, one of my fours of 500s a few years ago and I had to drill a hole to do it. I went through three drill bits, so that's actually legit. Um, the front Bowen mount area, not Bowen mount, the front uh, NAN light mount area is all metal. Okay, so that's not gonna wear out anytime soon. Okay, the next thing we'll pull out of the kit is the power supply. 
Now, because it's a 900 watt unit, it does have a way smaller power supply. Now the power supply and the lighter IP55 rated, so you can use them in the rain. Now it does have a Nutrix power in, but it doesn't have a Nutrix power through. That really isn't a negative for me, but I know it affects a lot of you guys who do rigging. The next thing I'll pull out of the kit is the clamp, which is designed for mounting your power supply to your light stand or to your rigging. Now, one thing I like about this clamp is it can mount on in all four orientations. So you can mount it from underneath and it auto locks. You can mount it sideways or any of the four directions that you choose to mount it. The next thing in the kit is the power cable, which is Nutrix and your original power cable on the other side. This is made from PVC plastic. I really hate these cables. We're just starting to get into cold weather now in Melbourne. So I had a shoot the other day. It was two degrees at location and this cable struggled to unwind. So I can only imagine what it's like if you're in a colder country. These cables are rubbish. I hope they improve them somewhere down the track. And the next thing you get is your head lead. Now, this is a quite a good length of head lead. It, it, I've had no problems with getting my lights um, at the top of a stand with the power supply mounted down the bottom. But you can get longer head leads if you like. Now, with these cables and the connectors, they do jam on the steerer, which can limit your ability to tilt up. Now, you can just simply put the cable onto the other side. But here's my problem with this. Between here and here, you tend to lose about 25 degrees of tilt angle. And the thing I'm constantly finding is the angle I want it on is always in that region. But here's a workaround. If you turn the stirrup around, you now have an uninterrupted tilt upwards. Now the next thing I'll pull out of the kit is the dish. So these are faceted dishes. This is a 45 degree beam angle. Now it is not a Bowens mount. They've got their own proprietary mounting system. Next thing I'll pull out is the remote control. Now the remote controls are now legal in Australia because they've changed the design. The uh, tablet battery can no longer fall out of the unit. It has to be unscrewed. Now you can run up to 12 lights off this remote control. Now the last thing in the case is the instruction manual and you also get a USB key for doing your firmware updates. Let's have a look how this light performs with and without its different modifiers. Now the 900C does have a lens on the front to mix all the color emitters together. And this does make the characteristics of this light very different to the 1200 and 1200B Evoque. Most noticeably, the beam does not appear to be as wide and it has some noticeable step offs towards the edge. Now there is some hue shift towards green on the outside of the beam. From this point outwards, and from this point outwards, the hue shift comes in with a delta UV difference of plus 0.0016, which is roughly about the equivalent of two thirds of a one eighth correction gel. Now, regardless of the CCT that you dial in, this characteristic seems to be in play. Now using full saturated colors, you can see the stepping drop off in the edge of the beam. And the color hue selected seems to be consistent across the beam from edge to edge. Now the shadows aren't as crisp as they are on the 1200 and 1200B, but they're still pretty sharp. Next I thought I'd see if this light can evenly illuminate a 5 foot octodome. Now the light from the COB does hit the reflector, but only just. Now in this test I'm using a magic cloth diffuser without the use of an inner baffold. And as you can see it is an uneven distribution with a hot spot. Next, I tried the light with the supplied 45 degree reflector. Now, the thing that blew me away with this reflector on the 1200 daylight and the 1200 bicolor was how even it was from edge to edge. But that is definitely not the case with the 900C. There is some distinct drop off towards the edge of the beam. Now, right on the very edge of the beam where it's starting to fade to black, there is some color hue shift towards green. 
to a value of 0 0.0050 delta UV, which is roughly the equivalent of a one quarter correction gel. This hue shift on the edge of the beam is consistent through your CCT range. In terms of saturated colors, the colors are very consistent from edge to edge of the beam. And here are the spectrometer readings in the center of this reflector at 3200 Kelvin and at 5600 Kelvin. Now let's take a look with the optional 60 degree reflector. Now the color hue that was on the edge of the 45 degree reflector is extended more into the beam on this 60 degree reflector. In the center of the beam, set at 5600 Kelvin, I get a delta UV of plus 0 0.0007. Now at this point here, the color is very consistent. The difference could actually just be my meter. But at this point here, it jumps to plus 0 0.0054, which is a little bit more than a one quarter correction gel equivalent. As I pan the light around, you can see this if you're looking for it. Now it does have a fairly consistent beam with a nice drop off towards the edge, but it's not as even as it would be if it was on the 1200B or the 1200 daylight. The color hue characteristics on the edge of the beam are consistent through your CCT range. With full saturated colors, the color is nice and consistent from edge to edge. Now here are the spectrometer readings for this dish at 3200 Kelvin and 5600 Kelvin. Now because there's a little bit of variation in this reflector, I took several readings all over the place and these readings are about the average. Now let's take a look at the light with the 26 degree dish. And this in combination with the 900C definitely has two distinct rings of light. I would go as far as to say that this is no longer a 26 degree dish. I think it's actually tighter with a fair bit of drop off. On a positive note though, all of the light is merged together from the color emitters and there's no noticeable hue shift towards the edge of the beam. Now let's have a look with the Fresnel. And this combination has some very interesting characteristics in terms of hue. The center of the beam is quite pure. But from the center out, the light becomes more and more green. The difference between the center of the beam and the edge of the beam is somewhere close to a one quarter correction gel equivalent. Now, while you can't really see it here, I think if you are working in a white psych or in a white kitchen, this would definitely bone you. The barn door cuts are quite good with the exception of a little bit of concaving. And it does spot up very well. And the results are consistent regardless of if you're in white light or a colored mode. And there is a little bit of double shadowing here, but it's what I would expect from an old Studio 2K or an old Studio 5K. And these are the spectrometer readings at 3200 and 5600 Kelvin. As you can see, the Kelvin is a little bit higher than it was with the dishes, but nothing to really worry about. Okay, let's start going through the user interface. In the top corner here, you have the mode that you're currently in. On the opposite side, it displays what your fan settings are. And in the bar down the bottom, it tells you what is turned on and turned off. 
Currently, I have my Bluetooth turned on, I have my Wi-Fi turned on, my CRMX is turned off, this is my selected DMX channel, and the keypad is currently unlocked. If I want to lock the keypad, I hold the lock button down for three seconds. If I want to unlock the keypad, I hold it down for another three seconds. We are currently in the CCT mode. Regardless of the mode you've got selected, the blue knob here is always your brightness selector. In this mode, the center knob selects your CCT, which is adjustable in 100 Kelvin increments. And the right knob adjusts your green and magenta hue correction. Now this light goes up to plus or minus 200 on its hue selection. Now 200 might sound like it's double the amount of other lights, but that's actually not the case. This is scaled to Delta UV, so plus 200 is actually slightly less than a full correction gel. If you press the knobs, you can toggle between presets. The blue knob will toggle between your current value and off. The center knob will toggle between Kelvin presets. And the right knob, when pressed, will toggle between your plus minus green value and reset to zero. To change modes, press the mode button. A list of modes will appear. The right knob selects the mode that you want. Once you've made your selection, press the button. We are now in the advanced HSI mode. The right knob selects your parameter and the left knob makes your adjustments. Notice the two scales on the side here on the user interface. It is very clever. This one is my hue. And this scale here is my desaturation. Watch the bottom of this scale as I change my CCT. And watch how it correlates to the scale as I change my saturation. The next mode of operation is XY coordinate. Once again, the left knob is your brightness. The center knob selects your X coordinate. And the right knob selects your Y coordinate. The next mode of operation is RGBW. Once again, the right knob selects your parameter and the center knob makes your adjustments. Now let's take a look at the gels mode. Once again, the blue button toggles between your brightness value that you've got dialed in and zero. The center knob changes you between your CCT preset, which can be 5,600 Kelvin or 3,200 Kelvin. And the right knob selects your gel. You've got a list of CTOs and CTBs and also a comprehensive list of Lee gels. Now this light doesn't have Roscoe colors because Nanlux couldn't reach an agreement with Roscoe. And the last mode of operation is effects. Again, the right knob selects your parameter and the center knob makes your adjustments. Now let's go through the menu system. To get into the menu, press the menu button. The right knob scrolls through your selections. If you want to select something, press the right button. Let's start off with the first thing, which is address and DMX. You can select your DMX address. Next option is DMX mode. You have 19 DMX modes to choose from. To go back to the previous menu, press the menu button. The next option is reduced channels. Reduced channels removes things like fan control from your DMX profiles. Next option is your DMX dimmer curve. You've got linear, exponential, logarithmic, S-curve and gamma 2.2. The next thing in the DMX menu is your DMX smoothing. I'd recommend having this turned on as the light is pretty much useless in the DMX mode with it turned off. Let's go back to the main menu. Next is wireless control. Here you can adjust your Bluetooth settings. 
your 2.4G settings, your Lumen radio settings, and you can turn all of the wireless control on and off. Let's have a quick look in the Lumen radio settings. At the moment, my Lumen radio is turned off, so I've only got the one selection of on and off. If I turn it on, it'll automatically pair to my Lumen radio controller if I have one set. Note here that my fan has turned on into the smart mode. This gives me 100% brightness control over my DMX. Now let's go back into the menu and see what other options we have under our Lumen Radio settings. We can select our radio mode, so we can use this as either a receiver or a transmitter. And we can also link and unlink. The next option in the main menu is the network settings. You can select your network mode, your IP address, subnet, and a whole stack of other stuff that I don't understand. Next option down is your ARTnet and SACN settings. Again, I don't know much about any of this stuff. The next option is your fan control. You've got a choice of smart, full speed, low, and off. These options affect the maximum brightness settings on the light. You can rotate your screen, select your screen brightness. The next option in the menu is button backlight. If we turn that off, you can see the buttons no longer glow. Turn it back on and the buttons will glow. Now, whichever button you've got selected glows blue. You can select your language, stay out of that one. Firmware update, reset all settings. Now, if you do this, it will remove your CRMX settings. You've got your version information details. And that's the end of the menu system. Now, the only button I haven't explained on the back is the preset button. So if you press that, it gives you a list of all the presets that you have saved and you can manage your presets. All right, so let's have a, uh, a practical use for this. So let's go into a complex mode like say RFX mode. I've currently got the candle fire effect set. Now let's say I've done a whole stack of adjustments to this. Maybe I've changed my CCT. I've added a bit of plus minus green. I've selected the speed that I want. And I'm really, really happy with all the settings I've got here. And I wanna save them and come back to this scene. Well, what I do is I long hold the preset button. Now up comes the naming menu. So I can actually name this whatever I wanna call it. Let's call it um, fire. F, I, where's R? There's R. Let's call it fire zero one. Then I scroll back down to save. And now this is saved in my presets as fire one. Now I've already got other presets saved. So let's have a look at what I had saved as A. Now let's say I want to go back to our fire scene. I press preset, go down to our fire scene, and all of the settings are saved. Okay, let's go down to manage presets and see what options we have. So I can remove things that we've got saved. So let's get rid of A. So I'm going to have it removed. Am I sure? Yes. Now let's say I want to rename fire one and call it say scene four. Let's go to information, press on that and we can rename it. Let's call it scene four. And save. Now it's called scene four. Now, before we get into the next segment, I wanna show you one of the advantages that RGB ALC lights have over lights that generate colors using only RGB, and that is yellow. Yellow is very hard to generate with RGB color emitters only. All right, so let's get into the next segment now, which is talking about the DMX. Now, often there's a bit of confusion with this segment. DMX is a professional lighting protocol that works across various brands. It is nothing to do with the phone app. Okay, let's start the DMX testing. So I've got the 900C running off an 8-bit CCT HSI crossover profile. It has its smoothing turned on 
and it is running from its internal CRMX receiver. To give you something to compare it to, I have an Ari Sky Panel S60C, also running off an 8-bit CCT HSI crossover profile, and both lights are running with linear dimmer set. Now, this isn't a brightness comparison, so for those people who are interested, the 900C is about two and a half times the distance from the wall that the sky panel is, just so I can get an even exposure match for this testing. Let's start off with instant on-off commands. Now let's have a look at half second cues. Now let's have a look at one second cues. Now let's have a look at two and a half second cues. Now let's take a look at five second cues. Now let's have a look at CCT changeovers between 3200 Kelvin and 5600 Kelvin, starting with instant changeovers. Now let's take a look at some half second changeovers. Now let's have a look at some one second changeovers. Now let's have a look at some two and a half second changeovers. Now for some five second changeovers. Now let's have a look at some changeovers between a CCT and a Hue, starting with some instant changeovers. Now for some half second changeovers.
Now for some one second changeovers. Now for some two and a half second changeovers. And now for some five second changeovers. And now for some instant scene changes. Now because of this light's huge capabilities, I've collected a massive amount of data for this episode. So let's start going through that now, starting off with AC Power Draw. The maximum power draw recorded over several days of testing was 945.3 watt. At 5600 Kelvin it is pulling 915 watt. At 3200 Kelvin it is pulling 899.5 watt. And with the power supply switch in the off position it is still pulling 2.3 watt. Now let's take a look at our average CCT accuracies. From 1800 Kelvin to 3000 Kelvin, it is accurate typically to plus or minus 18 Kelvin. Between 3100 to 4000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 43 Kelvin. Between 4100 Kelvin to 5000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus 57 Kelvin. Between 5100 to 6000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus or minus only 25 Kelvin. And between 6100 to 7000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 17 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at the CCT accuracy between 8000 Kelvin and 20,000 Kelvin, taken at 1000 Kelvin increments. The column on the left is the target value. The center column is the actual CCT that I recorded on my meter. And the column on the right is how much it was out by. Now with the exception of 19 and 20,000, this light is incredibly accurate. Now let's have a look at the light's color render, measured in TM30RF. The lowest score of 89 was recorded at 1800 Kelvin. By 1900 Kelvin this has jumped to 91, and from 2000 Kelvin onwards it has very good color scores. Here are the results between 8000 Kelvin and 20000 Kelvin taken at 1000 Kelvin increments. And the lowest score here is a 91. But just note, at 20000 Kelvin I can't give you a score because the CCT this high is outside the parameters for doing the test. Now let's have a look at the white point placement measured in delta UV. And from 2400 Kelvin onwards, this light tracks extremely close to the Planckian curve. But just to note, it doesn't deviate to the daylight curve. Here are the results between 8000 and 20000 Kelvin, measured at 1000 Kelvin increments. Now let's take a closer look at some of our Kelvins, starting off with the lowest CCT we can dial in. When I dialed in 1800 Kelvin, I got 1797. The TN30 color render results were 98% average color accuracy with an average 109% color saturation. With the CRI scores R8, R9, R11 and R12 are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And at this point, the light is off the Planckian curve by a delta UV of minus 0.0025, which without adjustment would make it slightly magenta to about the equivalent of a 1 8 correction gel. Now from 2000 Kelvin onwards, I believe this light is good enough to use as a key light on your leading actors. So I'm giving you the results for 2000 Kelvin as well.
When I dialed in 2000 Kelvin, I got 1982. The TN30 color render scores came in with a 95% average color accuracy and an average 103% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R9, R11, and R12 are all below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution and the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0020, which would make the light at this point, without any adjustment, magenta to the equivalent of almost a 1 8th correction gel. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3180 with an SSI score of 85. The TN30 color render results came in with a 95% average color accuracy and an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 has a score lower than 97.5. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is almost perfect with a delta UV of minus 0.0003. When I dialed in 4400 Kelvin, I got 4464. The TN30 color render results came in with 95% average color accuracy and an average 101% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, and only R12 has a score below 96. This is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0004. When I dialed in 5600 Kelvin, I got 5619, with an SSI of 74. The TN30 color render scores were 95% average color accuracy with an average 101% color saturation. With the CRI scores, R12 was the only one below 95. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a delta UV of minus 0.0001, which places it almost perfectly on the Planckian curve. However, if you're using a camera that's balanced to the daylight curve, this will appear to be slightly more magenta than a 1 8 correction gel, assuming you don't make any adjustments. Now, because a lot of the lights we use only go up to 10,000 Kelvin, I've decided to give you the stats for 10,000 Kelvin as well. When I dialed in 10,000 Kelvin, I got 9,859. The TN30 color render results were 93% average color accuracy, with an average 100% color saturation. With the CRI scores, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point came in with a perfect delta UV of zero. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 20,000, I got 20,487. I don't have any TN30 color render results as 20,000 Kelvin is outside of the parameters for this test. With the CRI scores though, only R12 is below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution. And the white point is still tracking accurately to the Planckian curve with a delta UV of plus 0.0004. Now let's take a look at how accurately this light can dial in its color hues. Red was smack on at zero degrees. Green was smack on at 120 degrees. Blue, which should be 240 degrees, was very close at 241. Yellow, which should be 60 degrees, came in at 65. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came in at 174. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 276. That's another gear review done. And look, I really can't believe that Nanlux made this light. They have come so far in such a small amount of time. It was only three years ago that their lights were sort of an okay quality, and now they've got leading edge design like this. Now, a big thank you to the guys at Protog, who are the Australian distributors, for rushing me the only light that was in the country. Now, my apologies also for the delay in getting this episode out because I've been very busy as a working gaffer. So I've actually given up my weekend just to get this episode out of the way. Okay, thank you very much for watching and remember, take care of each other on set.